So I'm going to be talking about hunting for the biggest black holes in the universe. And the work I do is sits at this kind of interface between like, you know, stellar observation, galaxy formation, gravitational waves and black holes. Um, so I'm going to do my best to convey uh, kind of the, the range of this field and highlight my work within it. Um, Cause I can't sit still. I, I've worked on a bunch of different aspects of this field. Um, I'll try to highlight a lot of these. This is in two parts. Part one, pulsar timing arrays. So my good friend Chiara Mingarelli uh, works here and uh, she, she reassured me that not everybody might know the depth of pulsar timing arrays. So suggested I introduce them. Um, and as Max is saying, you know, there are these very, very small black holes that orbit, you know, they're, they're pretty big. They're 100, 100 solar masses or so. Um, and LIGO is able to detect these and it has been and this has been this wonderful break into this field of gravitational science and multi-messenger science where they're able to, they're able to track the electromagnetic emission from these objects. Um, but you can move down in, well, up, up in, let's see, down in frequency, up in time scale of orbit and get over to LISA band. And these objects are orbiting much more slowly. And because we know about Kepler's laws, we know that they're a lot further apart. Um, so to make very, very bright gravitational waves, they just have to be a lot more massive. Um, so here I have this animated panel showing the signal that we're going to take, which is orbiting on terms of like weeks to decades. So pulsar timing arrays detect the absolutely most massive signals in the universe um, coming from the most massive systems in the universe. And this is above 10 to the eighth solar mass um, black holes. And I've done this, this funny little question mark here. Um, the talk I'm gonna give today is talking about work that was published a couple of years ago, but it was the latest result that came out of Nanograph collaboration. Um, and I'm going to give you at least an outline of the, um, the sort of general plan going into the future. Um, and you know, here's a, kind of a slide on the human aspect of this. Pulsar timing arrays are people who are using radio telescopes to observe pulsars in the sky. Um, there are pulsar timing array contributors all the world around. Um, unfortunately, Arecibo is, is now collapsed. This was one of the biggest um, contributors to the North American um, Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves, which I'll call Nanograv for the rest of my talk, um, which involved Arecibo, a very large array and Green Bank Telescope um, in a North American led effort to detect gravitational waves. That's been going on for just over 15 years, nearly 20 years now. Um, similarly in Europe, using European telescopes, there's the European Pulsar Timing Array, Parkes Pulsar Timing Array has been led by the, the um, Parkes Telescope, and the Indian Pulsar Timing Array has been led by scientists in India, largely working at GMRT. Um, I list these out specifically because these four groups have over the past couple of years been forming this International Pulsar Timing Array, which is aiming specifically to do this kind of cross-validation of our data and our procedures. So we work loosely together, although we work independently on parallel problems. So the idea is that you know, we're, we're coordinating to try to come up with an answer about the same science um, and if one of us is, you know, doing it wrong, we, we tell them. <laughs> That's the main idea. Um, but I will say that Meerkat has this, um, well, Meerkat is the, is the, tel is the, um, is the telescope down there um, that is now doing pulsar timing. And the FAST telescope in China has been going for a couple of years now and um, seems to be coming up with some, some data that will contribute to all of these efforts. Now, pulsar timing generally is of course, we're using these radio telescopes to observe a pulsar. Here I'm showing this beautiful pulsar profile from my favorite pulsar, J047, uh, minus 3714. I think that's its digits. I feel like I said that wrong. Um, and, you know, of course, we know what pulsars are. They're these rotating neutron stars. But what's interesting about pulsar timing is that what we're doing is just continually, just about every two weeks, taking an observation of a pulsar. And we average it over a course of something like an hour and get a profile that looks like this. These profiles are very stable. This is representing one rotation of a pulsar. So you see when it beams across you, you get this really bright spike. Um, over time, if you don't have a good model of the pulsar, you might look back at the, at, the, um, at the same spot in the sky and predict when the next pulse will arrive. And if you've done it wrong, you will have a slightly offset pulse. And if that is the case, it means that you really haven't modeled correctly in your prediction for that pulse arrival time for one of these properties, right? 
some kind of unmodeled physical effect. So the pulsar is spinning, maybe you got the period wrong. It's spinning down because it's releasing energy all the time. So that spin is slowing. Maybe it's in a binary. Um, maybe there's some interstellar medium between you and that, of course there is. Um, so we have to model for all of those things. But if we perfectly account for those, we get some pulsar data that looks essentially like this. And this is the actual pulsar data set. This is a pulsar I observed with Parks years ago. And it's plotting the model arrival time based on the fitting for all of these properties minus the actual arrival time. And you can see that you know arrival phase is in microseconds. Um, we call these timing residuals because it's just the residual signal. And you can see it's pretty bang on zero with a spread of maybe about, I don't know, 200 nanoseconds. So that's pretty good all time. Now, pulsar, pulsar timing arrays are really amazing because you can get really precise measurements of pulsars. And pulsars are wonderfully um, regular spinners. And it essentially makes them like just a ticking test mass in space, right? So the idea of a pulsar timing array is not the array of telescopes, it's the array of pulsars. And at this point around the world, we're observing something like just over 100 pulsars around the galaxy. Um, so these are all galactic pulsars. We're observing each one. We make a model for each one and get really fantastically precise spin precision for each pulsar and make residuals. Okay, so if we fit for all the things we know about, look, there's a sinusoid because Earth's moving around the sun. There's some wandering term because our clocks on Earth are not totally precise, but we can correct for that. We correct for all those things. What's left is anything affecting Earth that we haven't modeled. And one of the things that we haven't necessarily modeled is gravitational waves. So over off in a distant galaxy, you might have a binary black hole and it's gradually orbiting, sending off this continuous stream of gravitational radiation, which is coming across our galaxy, hitting the pulsar and Earth at slightly different times because they're at different locations of the galaxy and oscillating the space time at Earth, which changes how we see this pulsar, right? It looks like Doppler shifted away and towards us. So it changes that spin, perceived spin frequency a little bit. Um, we also see the gravitational wave affecting the pulsar itself. So the net effect we actually see is the addition um, or difference between those two terms, the pulsar term and the Earth term. Do this for many pulsars and come up with some data. So here is, this is a simulated gravitational wave data stream where I've stuck in a really bright gravitational wave source, probably like, you know, a couple of megaparsecs from our galaxy at some like 10 to the nine solar mass binary, which is completely unreasonable, but it makes this really fantastic signal where you can see one orbit basically traces out two um, cycles of a sinusoid in this space. Um, and you can see here kind of very literally why we are sensitive to the frequency range we are. So we can detect signals on time scales of weeks because that's essentially the Nyquist sampling. You know, we, we take samples every two weeks. Um, and we can detect signals that are up to a couple of decades in frequency because the slowest binaries will trace out a sinusoid on the time scale of our data set. Um, and you can see that the, the sinusoid is actually changing a little bit over the course of the data. And that is due to that pulsar term difference between the earth term. So you end up with this not perfect sinusoid. Um, that comes, in, comes into play later when I talk about other things. Um, so we think that binary black holes exist in the universe. I'm gonna talk about them in more depth a little bit later. But um, what I wanted to point out is that when we deal with pulsar timing, there are a couple of different ways we expect to see these signals in our data. Um, the one I just showed is what we call continuous waves because it's just this continuous stream of waves on an ocean, right, in, in outer space. Um, if you have a universe full of binary black holes, there's millions to billions of these contributing to the signal and you have to add up all of those noise, you know, what, what effectively is a noise source, um, and note that you, know, you will end up with this sum of sinusoids. Um, that is a simulated gravitational wave background that I'm showing in the upper right, what the residuals would look like. And you can see again, I'm plotting three different pulsars in different colors and symbols. And you can see that it's, it's sort of just a red noise process, right? It's kind of like just a red noise, random walk. Um, more, more, more signal at low frequencies than high frequencies for each of those pulsars. Doesn't necessarily look exactly correlated, um, but definitely has similar noise properties. Um, I'm not really gonna talk about coalescence, but we can in principle detect the moment of, um, the moment of actual coalescence of a black hole by the fact that it just permanently deforms space-time and suddenly all of our pulsar um, periods would be wrong. 
So that's possible, but it doesn't happen very often for 10 to the nine solar mass black holes. It's like kind of a once, once in the century kind of thing. You know, give us another 80 years and we'll detect one. Um, so I wanted to just say briefly, I don't like putting equation slides out, but some people like equations. I've been walking around this, these hallways. I added this like 20 minutes ago. It's like, they'll, they'll like the equations. Um, so, you know, we, we need binary populations to make gravitational waves. And a lot of the work that people did kind of in the 2007 to maybe a couple of years ago era was build a binary population just from either simulations using things like Millennium when it was around um, and Illustrious more recently, or just based on observations in the universe of galaxy mergers, right? We know that there are binary black holes because we see galaxies merging. If galaxies have black holes, then surely those black holes become binaries. Um, so what I'm showing you here is that that background strain is almost literally just a sum up of all of the discrete binary sign signals. And this is some number as a function of redshift mass, um, mass ratio and gravitational wave or orbital frequency. Um, the gravitational wave frequency is, is twice the orbital frequency, um, at least for a circular system. Um, but then this also then relates um, directly to the host galaxy distribution. So if we want to predict binary black holes population in the universe, we can look at the number of galaxy mergers and make some assumptions or based on observations of the local universe for the galaxy mass function and merger rate. And we can use this to project to our binary black hole population. Here's the picture version that I often show instead of the equation slide, which is that, look, we have quantifications both through simulation and observation of the redshift dependent mass function merger rates and time scales mass ratios of, of galaxy mergers. You can, using those galaxy populations, put on top something like this, saying we know something about the galaxies, so we know something about the black holes because there's these um, seeming kind of co-evolutionary links between black hole mass and host galaxy properties. And you know, in an over, overly simplified way, we can then use this to simulate a supermassive binary black hole population. Now, um, what I'm showing here is an example simulation from um, some of the work I did with Joe Simon a couple of years ago. And I'm showing this to introduce the idea of a strain spectrum. So on the Y axis, we have the gravitational wave strain. It's a little bit like the gravitational wave amplitude, um, but scales linearly with distance. So it's not exactly a, it's not a flux or anything. Um, and it says a function of gravitational wave frequency. I've limited this to the pulsar timing band. So this is the decades kind of orbits. These are the weeks kind of orbits. And I've just wanted to point out that each binary in the universe has a dot on this graph. So each binary is orbiting at a particular frequency. Um, it's, you know, it has some separation and mass that defines how strong the gravitational waves are coming out of it. And over time, you know, systems just through emission or through some kind of evolutionary process will evolve from over here, kind of upwards over here as they get closer and closer together, emitting gravitational waves and in spiraling. Um, but the gravitational wave background is again, kind of sum up of all of these individual um, strains. Now, I'd like to show this plot because there have been many, many, many different simulations that have predicted the binary black hole population over the past 1995. What is that? Three decades? That's, that's wild. Um, but back here, Rajagopal and Romani, that's like the first paper I read when I started my thesis. Like, this is going to be a great career. Um, <laughs> and it was really exciting, but that was kind of the only thing for a while. And then as we started formulating ideas about the binary population based, based on different approaches, we found that there was a pretty big range of, of um, predictions for what the gravitational wave background amplitude should look like. Not only that, but also the shape, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But over the same time scale, you can see I have his arrows here. This is a plot made by um, uh, my colleague, Alberto Cezana. Um, you can look at the pulsar timing or search sensitivity, which has kind of fiducially improved um, over time. And now you can see about maybe year 15-ish, 2015, it looks like the pulsar timing sensitivity suddenly flatlined. Now this is in the face of new telescopes, new you know, backends that are really fantastically sensitive, an explosion of pulsar discoveries that have grown our pulsar timing arrays to more pulsars, 
So there's no reason that we should be suddenly flatlining in our sensitivity. By all counts, we should be improving our sensitivity. So it appears that for a couple of years, we've been detecting something that's making us suddenly stop, stop gaining sensitivity. So what, what is this? Now, this is, this is kind of wrongly a, a red point there. And again, I didn't make this plot or else I wouldn't have made that like a, what looks like a detection because we're not, we don't think we've had a, like a detection of something, but I'll explain what we're, what we're plotting there in a second. Oh, but I did want to point out that, you know, it is really at the point where we're hitting the predictions from a lot of um, binary black hole population studies that we start to flatline in this space. Now, I wanted to introduce the nanograv collaboration because that's the one I've been working most recently with um, the most. And here's a picture from actually earlier this week, there was a big nanograv meeting in Corvallis, Oregon um, that I think a number of people were at. I was not, sadly, I'm not in that picture, but here I am. Um, and, you know, the nanograv data set started in something like 2004, 2005, when a couple of pulsar timers got together and say, hey, if we work together, we could really do this a lot better. And after about five years, they had this, what looked like a really wonderful data set and made a gravitational wave background limit. Um, and over time, this collaboration has grown and grown and grown. And now it's about 120 senior scientists at about 50 institutions around the US. And we have this wonderfully fantastic data set that's just been this career making thing for many, many scientists um, over the years. Um, but we've been essentially monitoring a set of pulsars every three weeks for the past two decades. Um, and I have a, a statistic here that basically says how our sensitivity should be scaling with the quality of our pulsars. So, you know, we directly scale with a no number of pulsars. That seems weird, it should be square root of n, but in reality, we're doing pairs of pulsars that give us our detection, um, not a single pulsar. So we've got sort of an n times n minus one. So that gets us that scaling. Um, we should be scaling with something like the square root of the time baseline of our data. So the longer we observe, the more sensitive we'll get. Um, the number of observations and the pulsar noise um, are not as impactful if you've had a very long data set. Um, and there'll be, there's a reason for this that you can ask me about later. We'll, we'll talk about it. Because um, it seems like, you know, the better time pulsars you have, you should detect better signals. That's true. Um, anyway, so the Nanograv 12 and a half year data set is the one I want to highlight right now because it is the most recent published one. And again, it got published in 2020. I'm going to show you some results from that. But I do want to point out that there's this 15 year data set that adds about a quarter of the length to our data, but most importantly, adds a lot of time for these. <clears throat> these sets of pulsars that originally didn't have a very long time baseline. So the number of pulsars with a long time baseline has really, really increased for that 15 year data set. It doesn't look like a big time addition, but it is actually quite a big impact on our signal sensitivity. Um, so I was showing the strain spectrum before and showing you how, well, look, you know, you have these large separation binaries down at this end of the spectrum and the evolution of a binary at a very wide orbit is very slow, okay? And as you get closer and closer, it spirals faster and faster and faster and faster. So you end up spending a lot of time at this end of the spectrum and relatively little time at that end. Um, and that's a well predictable just by analytic work kind of spectrum that at least in the strain space should be something like um, strain to the minus two thirds in log space. So the slope of that gravitational wave background rises at low frequencies. So if you expect to see a strain background like that, and again, you're kind of thinking of the pulsar residuals as an addition of all of these strains from all of these objects, you should see something that looks essentially like red noise. Um, I don't know how good you are at taking Fourier transforms in your head, but if you're good at that, you know, look at this sinusoid looking thing. That's very long time scale. Um, look at, you know, if you had a short frequency sinusoid, you couldn't really fit very much amplitude in a, in a short frequency thing. So you can see already just in this data, that there seems to be a lot of power at low frequency and relatively little at high frequency. Um, and I wanted to set this up that way just to kind of set up this next plot, um, which is showing um, what we call the cross power delay. This is essentially the shared noise signal in all of the pulsar timing data sets. So imagine those three pulsars I showed before, we take the Fourier transform of that data, plot a power spectrum, square it, and judge how much power there is um, as a function of frequency. 
And pulsars are intrinsically sort of noisy with a low frequency rise. Um, but despite that, with our something like 47 pulsars that we have in the 12 and a half year data set, we are able to show that all of the pulsars seem to show a common noise process. And what I mean by that is that it's not only the same amplitude, but also the same spectrum. Um, and what I'm showing here is this violin plot. You can see these gray kind of streaks, which are um, showing just the likelihood range of noise at each of those frequency bins. Or I'm saying noise, but you know it's signal, right? It's some kind of some kind of sinusoidal signal at each of those frequencies. Um, so this process that we're calling uh, the common red noise process has been identified in nanograv. It seems to rise at low frequencies. <clears throat> Again, here I'm showing a similar range in frequency, something like you know a couple of nanohertz up to maybe ten to the minus seven hertz. Um, and I have you know just so you don't read while I'm talking, I'm gonna read this. Gravitational waves should be quadrupolar. That's that stretchy, squeezy kind of motion, right? But what we want to do first is search for an uncorrelated signal, which should be appearing in all of the pulsars. If Earth is being affected by a gravitational wave, that's a signal that we'll see in all of the pulsars. And it's the same, you know, if we're affected by many gravitational waves. Um, but, you know, this alone isn't convincing of a gravitational wave signal. What we really want to see is that spatial correlation signal from, um, from this quadrupolar nature. Um, so, you know, this is very interesting. And you know, it is exciting because this could be the first hint of a gravitational wave background. And a lot of us have been thinking about it like that, but at the same time, we're very, very cautious because we've seen things before like this and we've put them through much more rigorous tests and they've gone away. So we're kind of undergoing that process now with our 15 year data set um, where we, you know, we have more data now, we're a little bit more sensitive to whatever this process is and we're undergoing lots and lots of tests. Um, but, you know, throwing, throwing all that to the wind, if you did want to interpret this as a gravitational wave background, you could, right? You could fit a, some sort of an amplitude, you can fit a spectral shape, and then you can overplot it on the expected, expected amplitudes and spectral shapes that you would expect for various cosmological sources of gravitational waves. And it seems to be consistent with a binary supermassive black hole population, um, also could be consistent with cosmic string background and inflation. Again, it's not very constraining, so we can't really discern between those if this is a gravitational wave background. Now, what is kind of exciting is that it seems like all of the other pulsar timing arrays in the International Timing Array Collaboration do see a similar effect. Um, so this was an International Pulsar Timing Array um, paper that was written that combined old data sets from all of the, the pulsar timing arrays and um, ran a similar analysis. And you can see there, they're, they're independently analyzing um, the nanograv data, um, old PPTA, old EPTA data, and um, this is collectively called the IPTA data release too. Now I say old data because it's not the most current up-to-date data that was available at the time that this data set was assembled. Um, the IPTA is an international collaboration and does suffer some issues of, well, we wanna get our own thing first and you know, then you can, you can have our data. Um, at this point, we have been working in a much more collaborative fashion, and just this has been a long-term development of, you know, working out the politics of the thing. So I said we do want to see a quadrupolar signal. Well, what would that look like? Um, now, I'm plotting here what is called the Hellings and Downs curve. I might not know what the Hellings and Downs curve is. I don't want to, like, over-explain things. A couple of people. Okay, so what I'm plotting here is essentially a correlation coefficient. And it's a function of the angular separation between two pulsars on the sky. So two pulsars, one that way and one that way, are 180 degrees apart. And they should be correlated in the same way with a, a gravitational wave going through. If they're that way as well, you know, still 180 degrees apart, they should be correlated in the same way with a gravitational wave going through them. And similarly, if you tried to judge one 90 degrees, you know, no matter where those two pulsars are apart on the sky, with a background of gravitational waves, you would expect a particular correlation between those two data sets. Um, so Hellings and Downs back in 1983, I guess it was, um, actually sat down and predicted this curve and demonstrated what it should look like for a you know, gravitational wave, or sorry, gra gra general relativistic um, standard gravitational wave background. And this is what it should look like. It has this sort of shape where you're more correlated um, for two pulsars that are coincident on the sky, 
and for 180 degrees apart, but anti-correlated at this sort of 90 degree mark um, with these two zero crossings somewhere in the middle. And I'm showing here our 11 year data set, Hellings and Downs plot. Um, and nobody would look at that and say, wow, that looks really convincing. Um, the 12 and a half year, year, I kind of feel the same about as, as does all of Nanograv, but it does look a little closer. Um, and it looks close enough that we say, judging by the Bayesian evidence for this, that it's at about a two and a half sigma level of evidence for something that fits that shape. And two and a half sigma is not strong. Um, we've been working very hard with the international collaboration to lay out a set of detection thresholds and protocols. This involves um, data analysis techniques, including, you know, like move your pulsars around in the sky. Does that make this, the detection go away or is it still there? If it's still there, that's not a good sign. Um, you know, changing the distances of pulsars and seeing if that changes um, the signal. Um, we have a rigorous set of tests, um, but we also have a requirement of something like five sigma. Um, and I'm just gonna tease that I think on April 7th, that detection protocol list is going to be posted to archive. So watch out for that if you're interested in this field of you know, how we think a rigorous test should be done. Um, I also wanted to point out that one of the really, I mean, pulsars are always cool, but one of the cool things about pulsar timing arrays is that you can actually detect clock errors on earth. So all of the telescopes on earth are, um, linked to a maser, which is then linked to UTC time, which is corrected by atomic time. Now, if all of the clocks, the atomic clocks on earth were wrong for some reason, we would actually be able to see that as a monatomic drift in all of the pulsars. So all of the pulsars would have the wrong time of arrival and you would see a jump in every single pulsar. Um, this does not seem to be what's happening in this data set. This signal is not monopolar, which is what happens with the clock error. It also is not, Dipolar, which would happen with solar system errors. Can you think of why this would be dipolar for solar system? This is like, you know, we don't know where Earth is and its orbit around Earth, around the sun. Any idea? I know you guys probably won't speak up. What's that? Yeah, Jupiter or something. Yeah, like planets, right? Everything's along the ecliptic. So if you're shifting side to side in the ecliptic plane, you know, you would preferentially be moving in that plane and you would have correlated signals along the ecliptic plane, but not orthogonally to the ecliptic plane where you're not having any you know, radial motion in compared to those pulsars. So we are able to fairly confidently rule out solar system errors in our modeling and clock errors. Um, <clears throat> now I'm showing this plot from um, Javi Siemens back in 2013, um, showing how bright we would expect to detect a gravitational wave background or any type of you know, um, shared common signal at a particular um, slope. And that is where this um, detection statistic comes from and that scaling. Um, and this is basically showing that you know, from time zero to something like just over 10 years, if we get to the point where we, we, you know, we have our data, we're raising our number of pulsars, we're improving our, um, our pulsar measurements. So we're lowering our little sigma pulsar noise. Um, we should get to this point where our sensitivity is asymptoting towards this underlying signal and our sensitivity should roughly scale with time um, according to this um, line. That seems to be what's happening from our 11 to 12 and a half year data. And now, of course, going forward, we're all really holding our breaths to see what happens with the next data sets because we think that this will really make or break this field and may change things. Um, but so I already said that soon the detection protocols document should be released on archive. Um, we have a coordinated plan internationally um, to release the next wave of pulsar timing array data and analyses. And this includes the nanograv 15 year analysis separately for all the pulsar timing arrays, um, but in a coordinated way in about a month, maybe two, maybe three, you know, these things sometimes encounter delays. Um, but this is to say, invite somebody back maybe in a couple months, <laughs> or at least find somebody to give a talk in a couple months. And they can update you on all of this field and say, look, actually we, oh, we found this was some kind of weird pulsar effect, or we've you know, detected a gravitational wave background. One or the other, something's gonna happen. Um, and later on in 2023, um, we are gonna have this really wonderful data set where, like I said, you know, we're, we're now working much better together and we have, um, Somebody, Deborah Good, I don't know if Deborah has come here. I think she has, right? Yeah, yeah. So she's working with Kiara on this very up-to-date 
data release three. Um, and it's just oh, gonna be so fantastic. Oh, hey, Deborah, good job. <laughs> um, all right, so part two, binary black holes. So now we get in, you know, this was all pulsar time arrays and data analysis and things. Now we get into the messy, messy fun astrophysics and detecting supermassive black holes and kind of understanding how they link to things like galaxy formation. So, you know, I already said we get a population of binaries from the fact that we have galaxy mergers in the universe, right? Also, you know, I'm always jealous of the simulation shown on all the screens here. So there's my simulation that I didn't make, but it's beautiful. Um, you know, so track the binary in this interaction. Um, you know, there's a crossing. A lot of the gas gets stripped off of that binary. A lot of the gas gets upset. Stars get flung into the center. Um, there's a lot of funneling of material onto the central location where these two black holes end up. And over time, you have um, processes like dynamical friction that's driving the galaxy merger, um, but also driving the two black holes down to the center. At some point, they form a binary, undergo further processes, and um, start emitting gravitational waves, which drive them to coalescence. Now, I hate the title of this slide because this is not really a problem anymore, but what I want to do is reappropriate this term. Um, and I'll introduce the term first for those of you who hadn't, haven't heard it. Um, so I'm plotting here um, what amounts to the binary in spiral time scale as a function of binary separation. And you can see out here, it's something like a radius, radius being just the separation between two black holes of 100 parsecs. You get dynamical friction that's still kind of acting with the, uh, you know, the, the broader gas and, and stars from the galaxy. Um, early modeling, and this was from a paper in 1980 that kind of set this field in motion. Um, early modeling was saying, well, there's really only a couple of processes that can really drive these two black holes together. And the main thing is stellar interactions. So if you have a, you know, a star that comes in, it interacts with that binary black hole, the star will typically get thrown out, carry away energy, but then also carry away the star. And it's not gonna come back for a very long time because it's been flung, up, flung out at high velocity. And it was recognized that from the kind of interaction cone, loss cone, where you're feeding this binary black hole and those three body interactions, you would actually run out of stars. And it could be that your loss cone is depleted and you essentially keep a binary just sitting there in orbit at more than Hubble time. So this stalled binary black hole system. At this point, nobody really thinks that happens anymore. I think there is some sense that it might for some systems, um, but generally it's been realized that, you know, if you take some kind of realistic galaxy shape like a triaxial galaxy with triaxial orbits, um, you don't actually get lost cone depletion. You keep feeding stars into the center. Um, so three body interactions can continue at some meaningful um, rate. You also have gas that's coming in and driving the evolution of the binary um, relatively rapidly to coalescence or at least to the regime where you're emitting gravitational waves. Um, and if those things fail, at some point, you're just gonna get another galaxy coming in and drive that binary to coalescence. Now, what I'm trying to reappropriate the term last parsec problem uh, for, because I think it's a, a good phrase, is that we don't really know what drives the binary's evolution here. And something does, probably. You know, we don't, we don't see strong evidence of two black holes in, in the centers of all galaxies. Um, but the reason it really matters for pulsar timers is that it will actually influence the sort of change in orbital, um, orbital separation over time, especially at these early separations. So remember that strain plot where I was saying they actually spend a lot of time at large separations and relatively little time at small separations. If they're being driven by gas really quickly through this early phase, you won't actually have as big of a population there and that will affect your gravitational wave background spectrum. Um, so, you know, how, how, how do they get past this point at last parsec? How fast do they get and how much material are they really still interacting with? This can also really drive a change in the way we expect to see um, continuous wave signals. So traditionally we've modeled continuous waves as just circular systems. By all you know, LIGO accounts, you should have a circular binary by the time you get to be emitting gravitational waves because gravitational wave emitting is just, emission is just circularizing in, in just a few orbits. But if you have continued gas interaction, this can drive relatively large eccentricities that you then have to model for and use a lot of computational power to try to detect. So here's my very cartoony way of showing how all of these environmental effects might change your background. 
So here I'm showing this just fiducial driven only by gravitational waves kind of background. So that's just an example of galaxy evolution model. Let's say you have a limit from your pulsar timing arrays that's something like there. Well, maybe you could just totally lower this entire spectrum, right? So we're changing the amplitude of our spectrum by saying, oh, almost all the black holes stall. So none of them actually get to the gravitational wave regime. You know, we don't think that's happening. Maybe we don't have this big of a, ma big of, a mass of black holes that we, as we expected, it's also possible. It's also possible we could turn the assumption that almost all galaxies have a black hole in the center on its head and say, actually only half of galaxies have a black hole. You know, so there's a couple of ways you could just cinch down the, the complete amplitude of this background. Um, and you can see how these pulsar timing limits can influence something like that. But pulsar timing arrays are a little bit better than that because not only will we detect the amplitude, we will also detect spectral shape and curvature if we detect a background over the next something like five to 10 years as we get more data and are able to get you know, multiple distinct spectral data points across this. Um, and at that point, if we do see turnovers here, this is this effect where we're driving at binaries very efficiently through this early phase and um, not seeing as much signal at this low frequency. So we get a, a effectively a turnover in the spectrum. And this is almost always due to some kind of environmental coupling at that early phase, so extended stellar interactions, gas driven in spiral, eccentricity in the binaries that redistributes the power. Um, and the, the shape of the spectrum will, will give you that information. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about um, continuous gravitational waves, because this has been all about backgrounds. Um, and we do expect to detect something like two to 10, what I'm calling discrete sources. I hate to call them individuals since they're, they're binaries, um, but discrete sources by 2030. Um, and I'll show you some modeling for that. And from something like 2034, um, Lisa should begin really detecting hundreds of targets, uh, if not more. Um, so this was a study led by Chiara Mingarelli of your own fold, um, but that I worked with her on um, a couple of years ago. And what she had done was take the two mass survey um, of galaxies and run a prescription to say, okay, well, look, we know something about this galaxy. Let's assign a probability that it should contain a binary supermassive black hole. Um, she then was able to compare this with the predicted sensitivities of pulsar timing array data sets going from what was then 2019 up to something like 2029. Um, and then say, okay, well, look, let's make you know, a thousand universes and see in what fraction of universes we actually expect to detect a couple of systems. And um, one of the nice things she did was actually assign a detection confidence as a function of year um, for systems. And the outcome <laughs> of this is that, you know, you can see in 2019, which is, you know, a couple of years ago, we really didn't expect to see a signal. Based on just the, you know, density of galaxies in two mass by 2024, which is next year, we actually have a reasonably good chance of getting something like a two sigma detection of a binary, if this prescription is correct. Um, by 2029, these numbers all go up to 100% because that sensitivity of pulsar timing arrays is just good enough if it scales as we expect. So what would a continuous wave look like? Well, I'm kind of, you know, saying, well, it would be a sinusoid, but in reality, this is gonna be sitting on top of some kind of other background noise you know, and neither are gonna be this extreme, but you get the picture. And if we thought about this in terms of the spectrum, you know, in terms of the spectrum, each of these points, if this is binary black holes, would be made up of some large number of binary black holes. But if there were a really whoppingly bright one, like the one I simulated there, it would set one of these points like way up here, right? It's gonna show that everything has a sinusoid at that, at that intensity. Um, so, you know, it might look something like that, but just much more extreme. Um, and, you know, we think that's a noise feature, not to get too excited about that, um, but that is a, a version of what might you, what you might see. Um, so I wanted to, I feel like I missed a slide. Um, I wanted to uh, just walk through some of the work I've done in continuous wave detection, um, because what we've been trying to do is think about how we can actually be more sensitive to continuous waves and just explore that, that idea. Um, so I'm showing here the multivariate parameter space that we try to search to detect a continuous gravitational waves. And here we actually have right, a binary signal model. So we have our sky position, gravitational wave frequency, just some 
geometric terms, you know, what's your phase at a certain time? What's the inclination? What's the gravitational wave polarization? That's that little thing. Um, this is the chirp mass combining both the masses of the black holes and of course the distance, um, which all go into defining how bright the strain for this source will be. Um, so that last term is kind of redundant, even though that's the thing we quote. We also really don't have a good handle on pulsar distances. So if we want to calculate the pulsar term, that's actually some part of our search base that we have to search over. Um, and this is currently a minor effect in terms of how it influences our searches. Um, is, there one parameter, like, uh, is there a larger dependence on one parameter versus another? Yeah, there, there are. So, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but essentially the gravitational wave frequency is, is kind of the most influential thing. Um, right, so I'm showing here a plot of, basically if you just had one gravitational wave source on the sky, what is gonna be the response of the pulsars in our pulsar timing array. So this is just RA in this direction and DEC as the latitude there. Um, those white stars and the orange and red star, those were, those were the poorly behaved pulsars, so they got colors. But the white ones are, there's the rest of the pulsars in our um, 12 and a half year nanograv data set. And we've stuck a big whopping gravitational wave source there on one point in the sky. And you can see that um, in these continuous wave searches, we don't just have spectrum, we also have sky resolution, right? So that gives us a little leg up. Um, and one of the studies we've been doing um, a couple of years ago, just back in 2020, we published this um, with my student, Caitlin Witt, who's no longer a student. She's a wonderful postdoc over in Chicago. Um, but one of the things we did was try to say, well, look, you know, there are a couple of sources that we think might actually be binary supermassive black holes. And you've got people have gone out and measured their orbital separations, they've measured their periods, they've inferred masses. We know where they are in the sky, we know how far away they are because it's very easy to get a redshift. Um, so what if we actually use those to set constraints on our search space? Um, and this is an example of one of these sources, 3C66B, and it's very famous because it has this period that's something like 1.05 years, plus or minus 0.03 years, which is awfully suspicious because it's very close to one year and involves motion on the sky. Um, so, you know, whether this source is believable or not, it was expected originally to have a chirp mass of something like 10 to the 10, and that involves basically, you know, two 10 to the 10 solar mass black holes, which is huge. Um, but what we can do is use the measurements that were made of this source and the inferences made by measurement of the electromagnetic emission to set constraints on the priors going into our Bayesian search pipeline. So, you know, sky position is a total given because we know where it is on the sky. Distance is easily found through redshift. For this source, we did have a fit to the um, gravitational wave frequency. Um, and for some targets, this is true um, from other, other sources as well. But essentially we are able to house the parameter space. And I'm just showing here how this sort of played out. Um, there was a model that had this source originally very, very bright. We of course ruled that out completely. That had been rolled out before um, by just a single pulsar limit. Um, but we, we didn't quite get to the lower mass um, um, model that was made for this source. Um, but we did actually demonstrate that this type of search where you're limiting the parameter space could be improved by something like um, a factor of two over a blind search of the whole sky for, um, for continuous waves. And I'm showing here the really the most important parameter, like I was saying, is the frequency. And this is a weird axes, so let me describe them. So this is the mass of the system, the chirp mass. Um, and on the x-axis here, we have the prior width. So this is essentially, this is, we've measured it perfectly. This one, we've measured it within a factor of like, you know, one uh, in, in log, log space. <laughs> so within a factor of 10 or something. And you can see that if you had a completely unconstrained mass limit, you don't do very well with your, um, with your sensitivity limit. But once you have a pretty good um, constraint, even a really kind of poor constraint on that frequency, you know roughly what it is from electromagnetic emission, um, you can get a really big improvement of this limit on mass. Um, and I'm, this equates to something like a factor of two in strain sensitivity. Now, we also have been doing um, just what we call blind searches where we say, okay, well, we, let's not assume anything about the binary population or anything about its frequency. What we're gonna do is search for a binary anywhere on the sky. And what I'm showing here is 
um, again, because I know the, a similar plot to what was before, except um, what I'm showing here now in color is the sensitivity of nanograv. This is the 11 year data set and the 12 year data set, 12 and a half year, that should say. Um, and this is the distance out to which we could see a, um, a double 10 to the nine solar mass binary black hole system. Now, when I was a kid, we used to play this game of like, what's wrong with this picture? What do you guys think's wrong with this picture? It's a little subtle. I'll give you five seconds. What's that? I'll give you a clue. This one has more pulsars. We should be a little bit more sensitive. Do you give up? What's that? Yeah, so the scale only goes out to something like 85 here. So between the 11 year data set and the 12 year data set where we've gained like double the number of pulsars, we've gained a couple more years of data, at least a year and a half more of data, we've actually gotten less sensitive. What is happening here? So when we first noticed this happening, we of course went back and said, oh, we're so bad at coding. Like we have to fix our code and figure out why this went wrong. It turns out it wasn't the code at all. What it was is the fact that at the frequencies, so this, these maps are made at one particular frequency. This one is made at eight nanohertz. This one is made at 7.65 or about eight nanohertz. At those frequencies, you actually have an underlying common red noise process that's existing. And what we then did was just take a difference of the map sensitivities. And this is just a, a difference between those two maps I showed you before. And it shows that for some points in the sky, we are actually improving our sensitivity. So blue here is a better sensitivity. Like our, our strain has actually gotten better, our strain limit. For the rest of the sky, our strain limit has gotten worse at those frequencies. And I'm showing here um, the detection of common noise that you see. So for that, um, for if you're not modeling this common red noise process in our continuous wave search, we get these purple points and we actually say, look, we've actually detected a bunch of sinusoids at low frequency, but of course we haven't. We've just detected this common red noise process down at those low frequencies. And what that translates to is a frequency dependent horizon limit um, that we see bending down at those low frequencies. So you see even for the five, nine, 11 and 12 and a half year, um, this is partly just due to the non-sensitivity of our data set at those frequencies, um, but it also has to do with that common red noise process. And I'm showing the eight nanohertz line there. Um, but you can see overall, our sensitivity has improved at high frequencies as we would expect it to given the noise in our data um, and given the relatively small increase in time baseline we've had. Now, I, I don't want it to sound like I've actually said we have a horizon limit because that is not like, you know, eight, 85 megaparsecs is not our horizon limit for detection. That was specifically made for two 10 to the nine solar mass black holes. Um, and what I'm showing here is a simulation run by um, Luke Kelly a couple of years ago. And what he's plotting here is five different realizations of the universe. And he's only plotting the brightest gravitational wave source of a binary in each bin. So if you have you know, binaries here, he's then created the background, not including that brightest source. So you can see those lines are the background. And any of these points that has a, a black circle around it is what he's calling a foreground source. So I did wanna point out that um, there are sources here that stand out potentially above the background because they contribute something like more than 50% of the power to that particular frequency bin. Now, if the signal we're seeing in the nanograv data is not binaries, um, it is possible that this sort of thing is not happening and we're not actually able to see continuous waves above whatever other noise process this is that we're seeing. If that all is all due to pulsar noise, we're not gonna see binaries above it. And I wanted to just lay this over the, the 2DF survey um, <clears throat> to show you how grim this situation would be. I hate to, hate to like say bad news, but so here's like the worst point in the sky for the 12 and a half year data set. This is a redshift equivalent of about 0 0.1, 0 0.01, something like that. And that's, you know, something like 10 to the minus four cubic gigaparsecs in volume. And if you just run a standard galactic density, number density, this is like something like 300 to 1,000 massive galaxies. We're only sensitive to like a couple thousand galaxies. The best location in the sky at 12 and a half years, that's, no, that's a little bit better, you know, 
we get a fraction of a gigaparsec and about 15,000 massive galaxies. Um, but if we actually go and do, you know, electromagnetic enhanced emission, we look at high frequency, so we're not running into this common red noise process, we can push our horizon limit a little bit further and get something like probing 200,000 galaxies, which is a good, a good number. So even then, we, we do have some chance at doing continuous um, wave emission. But I did want to point out, I'm going to go back now to um, Luke Kelly's study, which is that the peak source in each of those bins was not necessarily a 10 to the 9 solar mass black hole. And I'm showing here, um, just focus here on the red bands here. These loud ones are the ones that are sort of like the foreground, the loudest source in the bin. Um, for a bunch of the frequency range, for much of the frequency range, those sources actually lay between something like 0.4 and 1.3 in redshift. So they can be relatively distant sources. And the reason for that is you have a much more likely chance of getting two very massive galaxies combining at those high redshifts, where first the galaxy merger rate is peaking, and also um, you just have more of a chance of getting a, a double very massive black hole because you have more volume you're covering. Um, so we might actually be able to see bright sources much farther. So I realize I'm running out of time. I just wanted to point out one more thing. Um, oh, that's such a cool animation. Ask me about it. Um, if we did want to find other continuous wave sources through electromagnetic emission, there are a huge number of sources that have been detected and claimed to be a binary in some way. And I'm just showing some random graphics of those. One of the big efforts we're doing now is trying to organize for the oncoming era of binary supermassive black hole science, both through pulsar timing and through the many, many, many surveys that have been done and are about to be done of the sky as a function of time. So me and my student, Jessica Sidnor, are now working on this thing called Bobcat, which actually had the first seeded idea here at BCA in a conference back in 2018 when we first came up with this idea because everyone was complaining that this doesn't exist. Um, and the idea of this is basically tracking all of the binary sources, looking at all of the different evidence for their emission, and being able to have this database as a resource for anybody who has means, you know, has, has a, a reason to use it, but also in a way to link directly with the pulsar timing um, sensitivity limits, which is not um, directly done these days. And currently, Bobcat, we're calling this binaries orbiting black holes orbiting black holes catalog, Bobcat. Um, there are currently 800 papers claiming a binary black hole detection or claiming, oh, that binary black hole is not a binary black hole because of this observation we've done. Um, and this amounts to about 500 distinct sources currently in our Bobcat list. And I did a very kind of loose thing here and just put our old uh, nanograv sensitivity curves. Um, I put an indication of where our common noise process is and put stars for a randomized gravitational wave frequency and uh, 10 to the nine solar mass black hole binary. In reality, each of these binaries could be anywhere along an ISO contour along that line, because if they're higher frequency, they're gonna be a little bit brighter. So those are kind of the span of, of sources. Oh, there's IPTA data release three. It's gonna be a little bit more sensitive. And you can actually see that we will be able to meaningfully probe a fairly large number of binaries here. And the situation's even better if we assume that these are all 10 to the 10 solar masses. Of course, they're gonna be a lot brighter. Um, going on into the future, it's gonna be really a fantastic era for binary supermassive black hole multi-messenger science if pulsar time arrays are able to detect binary supermassive black holes. With a huge number of wide field surveys, but also time resolved surveys, they're going to be tracking you know, flux variation and morphological variation of these sources. And that is it. So stay tuned in the coming months for the next wave of pulsar timing array data, data releases. It's going to be a, an exciting year for it, um, no matter which way it goes. The continuous wave horizon, um, we think we're probably going to need some new modeling approaches to figure out what to do if this common noise is or is not binary supermassive black holes. But also electromagnetic detection can significantly improve detection prospects. Thank you all. Awesome, thank you, Sarah, for a really engaging talk. Um, we have five minutes for questions. So people on Zoom, feel free to uh, unmute yourselves or type your questions in. Do we have questions in the room? Well, people gather their thoughts. I mean, it's really tantalizing to see the pattern that mm -hmm. almost suggests scaling some downs. So are there ideas for what it might 
be if it's not? Yeah, this? so, you know, we have a laundry list, essentially, of what it could be. The one that scares me most is the idea that, you know, we don't really understand neutron star interiors. And it's possible that there is some underlying physical process that forces pulsars to all obey the same variations with time. You know, to me, that's a, a real possibility. Um, it shouldn't be quadrupolar on the sky, of course, but that might give a common noise process and that, you know, two and a half sigma is not significant enough to yet really rule that out. Um, so it'll really be the next data sets that test that. Is, your, question. is, your, is the limiting factor in determining the quadrupolar pattern, the distribution of pulsars in the sky? I imagine if you had a more better coverage in the sky, maybe even the better. Mm. Or, so, I think, yeah, I sort of is the answer to that. So each of those um, bins, let me add some of those bins pictures. Each of these bins um, has averaged over however many um, pairs there are within that bin. So the more you have, the better an average you have so that, you know, that error bar will go down a little bit. Um, but it also depends on the underlying noise processes. Um, if you even if you do have a pure Hellings and Downs curve too, though, it's never going to be perfectly along the line because of that uncorrelated pulsar term. Mm -hmm. So there is an underlying noise that you expect to see um, on top of that. Smaller. What's yeah, that? It's way smaller than it's way smaller, and actually, I think it would be expected to be the same kind of fundamental size all across the, the angles. Uh, so, is there you want to um, is there is a continuous wave source? Is this is the Hellings and Downs curve calculated as a function of frequency, and that's why a continuous wave source doesn't like mess it up? Or so a continuous wave should also have a quadrupolar correlation. So in principle, should still look like this. Okay. Yeah. So it shouldn't mess it up. I mean, this is made of, in principle, you know, if it if the Hellings and Downs curve would be made of many many binary black holes. Right. Is okay. Maybe the question that I. Is it calculated as a function of frequency, like gravitational wave frequency? Oh, I see. Like, do you calculate a Hellings and Downs curve at each frequency? No, because it's um, it's created as a correlation between a time series, essentially. Yeah. So you know, red noise in, in each pulsar, but you, you cross correlate those. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, we have a question by Yuri online. So Yuri asks, Hi, Yuri. how will you tell between binary black holes and cosmic strings? Oh, good question. Um, so, I mean, fundamentally, to me, I think we would have to detect a continuous wave to tell between them. I don't think there's any reason a string should show a sinusoid. You could, you could arrange for that, I'm sure. But I think it would be more likely to see a binary black hole as a sinusoid and also, of course, identifying its host galaxy and showing that it actually has electromagnetic emission that's in the center of a galaxy. All of that would be pretty fail-safe evidence that you are, in fact, seeing a continuous wave. And if you're seeing a continuous wave, you're for sure seeing a background because it can't be that far behind. Um, the other way, and that's a little bit less discriminating, is um, the spectrum. So looking at the shape of the curvature of the spectrum. Um, if you see curvature, that's probably more likely to be from binary black holes. And then I guess the final answer I would say to that is wait for LISA because LISA will be able to detect cosmic strings if we are detecting them. I think that's a true statement. Yeah. 